shot. You don't have the flu, do you? You look okay. I don't know what it was yesterday. Okay. <laughs> Psychological. <laughs> okay. Uh, so today, we're going to start uh, the next chapter. This is on, uh, we're going to get more practical here with the uh, projectors. And we'll start off talking about the standard ones, PZT type projectors. And for reasons that we'll see in the later lecture for this chapter, uh, they, they don't work well at low frequency, so you have to come up with alternative ways. People have come up with some weird ways to generate low frequency sound in water. <coughs> so um, here, there, here are the sort of the basic problems. Um, f first of all, as you probably, as many of you probably know, usually you don't deal with just one projector. It's called an element here. It's, it's usually an element as part of an array. So typically, um, large arrays are used. Uh, this is, I think this is mainly to just get bigger amplitude. Um, and that's one of the basic concerns there is to get sufficient amplitude. Uh, so the, the elements are usually operating on resonance or, or a little bit off resonance. And almost always, as we've mentioned uh, sev already several times in this course, typically the wavelength is large compared to the, to the elements. It doesn't necessarily have to be large compared to the array, okay? And you can take advantage of that as you've probably learned in the other acoustics course, right? You did that already. Right, yeah. So um, you can have toad arrays, for example, that are quite directional due to the fact that the array is, is not small compared to the wavelengths. You can take advantage of that. Um, <clears throat> typically, solid transducer materials um, are used, like PZT. Uh, and they're almost always composite. And what that means is there's, uh, there's the transducing mass, but then there's other mass in there that's taking part, that's, that's necessary. And we'll start to see why today that's done. Um, yeah, now I don't know if there's much of a difference between composite and segmented. We may have talked a little bit about segmented before. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in depth in this chapter. Okay, so this is where the, the actual transducing mass is physically segmented with, with non-transducing mass, sort of inert mass or whatever you want to call it. And we'll, we'll see the reason for that in this chapter and actually cal you do calculations. Now, sound is, of course, longitudinal, so it's natural. You know, if you've got some PZT, it, it's, you, you don't want to operate it in a shear mode, right? You want to operate it in a, a compression expansion mode because that's what's, what sound is. Um, and so for pract practical reasons here, one of the sides of the, uh, of the transducer, so when we're operating in a longitudinal mode like this, one of the sides is going to be emitting the sound into the water. And the, um, the other side, we, we don't want, to, to efficiently emit the sound here, what do you want to have? You want this to be as heavy as possible so that you efficiently emit, emit um, so you can efficiently emit sound. And also, you don't want sound radiating back and back and that's, that's not good, right, for a lot of reasons. So we'll see how this is handled shortly. Um, Right. Now, the, 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 this is really, this makes it sound like it's the casing or something like that. This is really, what we really mean here is more of the, the we have the transducing mass, which may be segmented and, and often is. Then there's the support structure, okay? That's what we really mean by, I think this is not quite the right word here. Uh, where was it? Um, yeah, 
the the support of the projector. I, I wouldn't. I, I'm I'm going to alter this a little bit. So we we obviously have this our sort of bare mass that's being involved in the transduction here. There will be a support structure that has to be obviously it has to be strong and has to be able to handle a hydrostatic pressure down in depths. Uh, but on the other hand, it has to also be uh, acoustically to, to some degree acoustic acoustically transparent, or you won't get any sound, very little sound out. Okay, so these are just some of the basic ideas here. We can look a little bit more deeply, more quantitatively here at what's going on. Um, we Obviously, one of the criteria, and criteria here is to have large radiated power with efficiency. So what is the radiated power? Well, you remember we have this simple expression from last quarter, right? Because when you see this, you should see resistor, right? The average power is one half the square of the peak current in a resistor times the resistance. That carries over to acoustics. Instead of current, we have the analogous quantity, which is the velocity. This is the peak velocity. So we have something that's radiating sound. The total power is going to be given by this, where this is now the radiation resistance. And we spent a lot of time last quarter working on that. And I'll remind you on the next page here. So this is easy to remember, which is nice. Now, to get what should be important in the power here, to get more power, obviously, you can increase the velocity of the moving surface, right? But there's another way. What's that? And it's not, you don't really see it here. It's buried in here, and we're, we need to get it out. And that's what we're going to be doing right now. What's another thing you can do? Increase the radiator resistance? The area. Oh, okay. Right? So I got a moving surface. If I increase the velocity, I'm going to increase the power. If I increase the area for the same velocity, I'm going to get more power, obviously. And you would expect that those two should enter on sort of equal footing, that it should be equally important. We will actually, you will see that that's the correct, that that's correct here as in a, um, as we go on in this, cal this calculation here. So we deal with what's called the volume velocity. Unfortunately, people uh, often use Q here. Now, this is, not, this is not the quality factor, OK? So the volume velocity is just the, um, the velocity times the surface area, the moving surface area. And we know that increasing either of these is going to increase the power. And it turns out they, they come in on equal footing. You don't square. We don't square the velocity, OK? We don't, it's just sort of equal, equal footing. So if we take this, and we'll see, we'll see that this works in a moment. We take this and substitute it into here, get rid of the velocity, and now we have this. OK, and now we've got to deal with the radiation resistance. And let me remind you of the cases that we can, we're going to consider two standard cases, and we considered those in depth last quarter, <coughs> a baffled Piston, circular piston. Should be cir circular. Technically, should be added there. Um, and a uniformly pulsating sphere. Those are the two cases we're going to consider. So first, for the uh, piston here, you remember the radiation. It's, it's a, that's a complicated problem, right? And um, and baffling it helps, makes it less complicated, but it's still a complicated problem. And here is the result. You may remember, this may look familiar to you. There's um, the, the wave impedance here multiplied by the area. And these are dimensionless impedances here, um, a, the dimensionless resistance and the dimensionless reactance. And it's stated in terms of these functions here. And it's convenient to use, uh, don't worry about this. It's convenient to make this 2Ka. And you don't need to worry about it here. <coughs> Um, these are, in general, complicated functions. But you remember, they simplify in the two limiting cases. The two limiting cases are where we have small wavelengths compared to the radiating surface. Okay, And that's very simple. That means Ka is much greater than 1. Ka, K is 2 pi over the wavelength. So when the wavelength is large, this number is going to be, the Ka number is going to be big. And in those cases, um, this dimensionless resistance just goes to one, and there's very, there's very little reactance. And why is there very little reactance? 
You should have a physical feel for that by now, okay? It's like you're taking a string and driving it, and the energy is just going out. There's no near field where there's an interplay of energy going back and forth. There's no reactance or very little reactance in the short wavelength case, purely resistive. And you can, that's, that's what the math is telling us here. Um, however, that's not the, that's not the uh, case for sonar. Almost always, the wavelength is large compared to the element. So we want to use the other case. We'll use the other limiting case here. This is where the wavelength is large compared to the size of the source. And in that case, here there is some resistance and reactance, OK, of course. And um, we'll be dealing, for our calculation here, a simple calculation, we're going to be dealing with these. So what we can do is we can take the radiation resistance, which is this times rho naught Cs, and plug it into our formula for the power on the previous page. And here I've substituted in the radiation resistance. That's all that's relevant for the radiated powers. The radi is, is the um, radiation resistance. I've plugged it in here, OK, and simplified. And now we have it actually an, a, a pretty simple expression here. Um, it it's, it's involves the, vo the volume velocity here. This is a reflection of, there's some frequency. This is the frequency dependence. It's in, it's in terms of the wave number here. And this is the medium right here. Now we're going to make one more step here in this analysis. We're going to look at the quality factor, the radiation quality factor. OK. And um, you know that in general, any time you deal with os waves and oscillations, there is a quality factor. And you know that, uh, I think we talked about this somewhat last quarter, it really comes up a lot in the nonlinear course, which is not being offered this spring, but hopefully next spring. Um, and that is that when you deal with Q, there are many different perspectives. on You can think of Q in many different ways, and that's very useful. So you can use, in other words, you can define it in a, a number of ways. Okay. And they're all usually equivalent, especially for higher Q. Sometimes there's differences. But one of them that may surprise you, and I, I, and I have to be honest with you, when, when I first encountered this, I didn't realize this. But you can think, you can show this. Just do it for an oscillator. You can show that um, the Q here is the ratio of the reactance to the resistance. So um, all right, and it's uh, and it's it's easy to show. So here it is. Here's the um, the radiation quality factor for a piston. It's going to be the reactance over the resistance. We've used this before. We haven't used this. Now we're going to use it. When you do it, you find this a pretty simple expression. It's dimensionless as it must be. K a, and you'll notice. As K increases, the quality factor goes down. What's happening there? When K increases, what does that mean? What are you doing? What's happening to the frequency? K increases, the wavelength's getting shorter, the frequency's going up. So what you're seeing is you're getting a better impedance match if you want. You know, the reactance is going down. You're approaching. As you keep increasing the frequency, you start approaching the small wavelength limit where there's no reactance. OK, so next, um, to show how, to, to get an indication that these sort of general results, these two results here are not really specific to a piston. They're actually quite general from an order of magnitude point of view, or even actually better. We're going to now look at a, a, a very different case. That's the uniform a uniformly pulsating sphere, right, that we did last quarter. So you remember the specific acoustic impedance, the pressure divided by the velocity. And what we care about here for the radiation resistance is the evaluation of this on the surface of the sphere. It's given by this expression right here. And that probably looks familiar to you. And the connection between um, this angle here, you can get the angle in terms of the Ka number from this right triangle 
construction here. <coughs> so uh, the radiation impedance is just the area, S, uh, 4 pi A squared times the specific acoustic impedance. Okay, and then uh, for the power, we need the radiation resistance. That's the real part of this. So here's the, uh, here's the easy C. This is the real part. And now from the triangle construction, we can get rid of the cosine here in terms of the Ka number. That comes from the triangle. And now because we're interested in long wavelengths, we'll make the approximation that Ka is much less than 1. So we kill this, and we get this expression. So we substitute this into our simple formula for the acoustic power. And now we get this. We can simplify it. And you'll notice here, if you compare this to the previous case, it's very nearly the same. It has the same dependence upon the volume velocity. There, then there's the k squared there and the, the impedance. And then there's a, a numerical factor, uh, a dimensionless numerical factor. And both of those numerical factors are they're roughly the same. In fact, they in this case, they differ by a factor of two, I think. If you look here, yeah, I think we have an 8 pi. Okay, So they're very similar. Even though the geometries are quite different, um, you can see that they're very similar. Uh, now, finally, let's look at the quality factor the radiation quality factor for a pulsating sphere. Now we take the reactance, and instead of a cosine factor, it's going to be a sine here. This is the imaginary part of the impedance. And we get this. Again, we make this approximation. And we get this. And you'll notice here, this is um, Yeah, never mind, I'm going to say that. So here's what we get for small Ka is this. And now we can form the ratio of the reactance to the resistance to get the qual radiation quality factor. And it's 1 over Ka. Does that look familiar? It's similar to the previous result. Oops. OK. Except for these, fa and these factors are of, of, of the same order, same, same order. Now, one of the things you want to notice here is that um, <coughs> what this is showing us here is what's, for a given uh, fluid, okay, for a given rho naught C, or impedance, specific acoustic impedance, and at a certain frequency, we see that what's important is the volume velocity. That's what this is showing us. It's confirming what we suspected. That um, if you look at the power here, which is up, you can see that for a given fluid and a given frequency, what's important is the volume velocity. So that's what, that's what we suspected, and that's what we're seeing here. So they do enter at equal footings, the area and the velocity. Doubling the area, for the power radiated, doubling the area is the same as doubling the velocity. Right. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, what is good? It's, Look at think, get back to water here. Water has a relatively large specific acoustic impedance. So to couple sound into water, you want to have roughly the same impedance, right? Remember that from last quarter when we looked at transmission of sound? When you have two mediums with a boundary in between and you want to transmit sound, you want their, you want their impedances to be roughly the same. If they're not, if they're De deviate significantly, you get very strong reflections. So that's it's kind of universal for waves, right? Not just acoustics, all other waves too. Um, <clears throat> so we can do that with a solid transducing material. It's going to have an impedance that's roughly the same as water. There is a problem here, and it becomes um, 
insurmountable or unsurmountable? Insurmountable? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, at low frequency, so you have to abandon the PZT, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll deal with that later, later in this chapter. <coughs> but for now, <coughs> at moderate frequencies, this, um, this is looking good, the solid transducer, because it's going to have impedance that's roughly the same as a liquid like water. Um, now, again, as I mentioned earlier, typically, you know, th these are amplitudes are very, you know, these are micro strains as we've seen, right? So typically to get a reasonable sound amplitude in the water, you want to operate near or at resonance. <coughs> now typically the, the frequencies of the transducing material, you know, the resonant frequencies are going to be, are, are going to be high, right? And often they're too high for, of, inter for int of your interest in water. Because if you go to high frequencies in water, you're going to get attenuation and it's probably not going to be, that sound will not be useful to probe to see, okay, to see what's out there, because um, the, the higher the higher frequency, the greater the, ten, the, the attenuation. So, there's a standard technique that was developed long ago, probably probably World War One, and and that is this, the. The transducing mass, okay, and I feel funny saying transducing mass because it could be segmented. There could be non-transducing material in there, okay, so just keep that in mind. But what I'm just going to call it the transducing mass now. What's done is it's mass loaded on either end, all right, it's a simple idea. Uh, next week we'll do some, we'll do actually some specific calculations on it, but for right now, you can see that what, what, one of the things that that's going to do by mass loading the ends here is it's going to lower the fundamental frequency, right? Obviously, more inertia. There's another, it's something else that's not so obvious that there's it's a big advantage here. When you're driving a piezo, just the bare piezo, without mass loading the ends here, and you're driving a mode, what does the strain look along here? What does the strain look like? It's not constant, right? It's a standing wave. It's a standing wave. So it's the usual kind of standing wave. When we mass load it, now what kind of straining do we have? At that we lower the frequency. What's the strain look like? It's uniform because of the mass loading. So this means you can drive harder. The, the weakest length here is going to be where there's the greatest strain, right? So if you have a standing wave in there, you're going to be limited by the maximum strain, which is going to occur at some point, some point in there, some node or anti-node, depending on how you're defining, defining those. But by adding the masses on here and lowering the frequency, we go to a uniform. So it has the advantage that now the, the strain is the same everywhere. We're not going to be limited by one particular point where the thing can crack because we're driving it too hard. It's going to, it's spread, in a sense it's spread out. You can think of it, we're, we're spreading it out. So it turns out to it's not obvious, but it turns out to be a nice uh, it's a nice advantage. Um, also, this is a little deceptive here. You don't want. Okay, so the whole thing with tra as you'll see when we go through this chapter is there are trade-offs everywhere. You have to you have an overall goal in mind, and you have all these specific design features or you know design variations that you can make, you want to come up with the best overall transducer for whatever your purposes are, okay? So there are often things are conflicting. So you might think you'd want a high Q, right? Why? Why would you want a high Q? To get bigger amplitude, right? However, what's the problem with a high Q? Can you just, can you think of something? Imagine you're out on a submarine or something. What about transients? Uh, that's not good. Right? You want to be able to get clear information quickly and not, for, not, for it to be cluttered due to, due to transients from whatever source those transients come from. So um, <clears throat> ultimately it's going to come from the, if, when you make a change in the projector, you don't want to have to have a long wait time for things to settle down, right? 
Also, you want some kind of bandwidth where you want to be able to vary the frequency to get more information. I'm sure that's part of it. Um, and if you have a very narrow queue, you won't, your amplitude will change a lot over a small frequency interval. So it's nice to have a reasonable bandwidth. So <clears throat> here, the mass loading also has an effect. Because it's lowering the frequency here, it's, um, it also tends to give you more bandwidth. Right. Now this is, to be honest, this is not really obvious because it's not, there's also the damping parameter here, right? So, um, but just from a rough point of view right now, there will be this effect where by mass loading, bringing the frequency down, we lower the Q. Um, now there's another, um, We want to get big vo volume velocity, right? So there's another thing that can be done here, and that is this. You can flare, or whatever you call this, you can flare the radiating head here. That gives you more surface area. It also does something else. Do you, you know, this is solid. This is um, water, right? What's, what's happening in this region right here? What does it look, what's it look like to, when you see this change going on here? It's kind of like impedance matching. The impedance is going to be um, greater here in the solid than it is in the water. This is helping match the impedance. Now there are drawbacks to this as we will um, discuss briefly today and we'll get quantitatively into it in the next lecture. I think the next lecture, okay. But anyway, this is very common to do this. So you end up with something here. Here's the, uh, the radiating mass. Here's what's called the tail mass. So this has been mass loaded, as I described, to bring the frequency down, right? And it also spreads out the string. Here's the ceramic, typical geometry here. And here's an example. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is not solid. It, this will be really heavy. If, this is a cylinder, OK? A, a piezo ceramic cylinder and it's mass loaded. This is just a laboratory thing. It doesn't have a flared head here. It's symmetric. Um, but that's an example. And you see with the flare head here that this thing looks like a mushroom. So this goes way back. I don't know this specific history, but um, what happened here is that Maybe the Germans were ahead in the technology here. So they called it the German word for singing mushroom. Is There, there is a word for singing mushroom. That's kind of surprising. <laughs> Maybe they invented it. I don't, you never know with, with Germans, right? Um, I'm just joking. Uh, so it's tone pills, OK? Now, in, uh, in you know, Germans, uh, nouns are capitalized. I think they still do that, right? Is that right? So I don't think we need to do that. I, 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 I'm taking the lead here in de decapitalizing that, OK? I don't think we want to. So anyway, so tone pilts, or some Americans often call it ton pilts, of course. But um, it means in German singing mushroom. And that's where this, the, and this has stuck. So this is a universal language used to describe this kind of system. Now you note there's something else going on here besides the, the transducing ceramic and the mass loading. What is it? It's this thing. Why is this here? Take a wild guess. Compression. Why do you need to, why do you need to compress it? Changes Yeah, it can, um, you know, we're talking about, it. You, you know, the stresses are, are, are very large here. So you can have actually separation if you, um, you know, from the, there's, you're gonna, this is going to be adhered some way here. Right? So to keep things from falling apart and rattling, you keep it, it's universal to keep these under compression. And the tip, we will encounter some typical values later. I can't remember what they are, but they're not small. They, people crank on this. You can't do it too much, of course, because then you could, you could break it, you know, compression-wise, but thanks. I'm going to stay. All right. Um, Okay, 
Now, this is interesting. This is a cutaway of an actual uh, tone, tone pilts projector, OK? I don't know which. Oh, Brian's usually good at saying what these are. Uh, no, he didn't say what model. He didn't say what. The, often he'll actually quote what, um, what the model is. So here, now this is flipped from here. Here's the radiating. Here's the head mass. All right, you can see the clamp bolt here. Uh, there's other things going on. Oh, here's the, uh, the, here's the ceramic. Oh, and can you see these little slightly dark regions there? It's certainly segmented. When we get into segmentation, I'll bring out some segmented versions, okay, of this. So it's segmented. Um, there's other things going on. Here's the tail mass, right? What's this for? Tuning inductor. Take a, take a guess. We'll, we'll, it'll come up uh, later on in this lecture. Tuning what? It's to match the, you know, you don't want impedance mismatches here, right? So you've got an amplifier. You're sending a signal to an amplifier that's driving this. You don't want an impedance mismatch between the amplifier and here. So this is to match the impedance of the amplifier, output impedance of the amplifier. And again, if you have um, impedance, Serious impedance mismatches, you get reflections. It's just a, it's a universal phenomenon. It occurs in electric circuits too, not just for waves, right? <coughs> okay. Um, what else? Oh, I think that's about it. Okay, that's about it. And then, you know, look, and, and I, I'm sensitive to this. They mounted it. It looks like they mounted it probably on some wood. And what's this? They're telling you what it is. It's a plaque, right? See, I do this all the time, right, because of the demo room, because I'm in the demo room. <laughs> yeah, it's important to go all the way when you come up with displays or any kind of demonstration. Because years later, people may have no idea what's going on here. At least they have some information. And also, you know, it's attached to a nice base here. That's very useful. You need to do that. Well, you don't need to do it. I need to do it. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, now, uh, again, we'll get into this quantitatively in, I think, the next lecture. But there are um, limitations here. There are always limitations. You might say, why can't I just make this large, make, keep making this bigger. Well, you're going to hit a problem here. Remember, this is a solid material. This is a solid material. Their acoustic characteristics are not going to be a huge, they're not going to be huge differences between our acoustic characteristics. So if I'm um, driving this here, there's the chance that I can get standing waves in, in, these, in these masses here. That's a big problem. Why do you not want this, the face here flexing like that? Why is that not a good idea? What's going to what's, what's going to do to the sound coming out? It's going to degrade, I think, your signal. It's not going to be as coherent. So you need to be careful and design, make sure, and we'll, go ex we'll s explicitly go through this in the next lecture. We'll check to make sure that we're not we're away from the flexural resonance of this, of the radiating face here. <clears throat> what happens with, I think, with, with it going like this is you'll tend to get some destructive interference. All right, so now, specifically, to, to see what, what it's like to design to come up with a, an element of an array. We're going to consider a specific case. I think this is probably a World War II example. Some of you may recognize the, this here. Anybody recognize that? I don't know if it's still being used. OK. So oh, this is not it. This is just a, an example drawing that I showed. This is a um, cylindrical array. So the, trend, the, the, project, the elements are all on a cylinder here. Okay, and they, you can think of them being along these lines. The actual array 
has 48 lines. I, I only have six here, okay? I got tired after six. Okay. So there's six there, but there are 48 in the actual system here. And there are nine elements in each line. There are nine, not three as I've shown here. So there's a total of 432 elements. Um, and this thing is big. We'll see the dimensions down here. It's big and it's heavy. So it sends out sound in, um, this, this tends to be in this direction, right? Cylindrical, like that. <coughs> so here are the specifications. Um, <coughs> each element uh, is, is, has to be a longitudinal resonator, a PZT, type one, that's hard, tends to keep its polarization, PZ, a navy type one. Um, that's the active material. The, the overall dimensions of the arrays, it's six feet in diameter and five feet in height. So it's big. Uh, cavitation, we're going to talk, we're going to get more specifically into this in the, in the next lecture. But you all know about cavitation, right? But the, the design specification here is that it, um, when it's operating at full power, it doesn't cap cavitate at 50 feet. Above 50 feet, it could cavitate. What about below 50 feet? What's going to happen? You guys, you guys must know this. OK, well, we'll talk. We'll explain this. Um, I, thought, I thought all Navy people knew about cavitation. <laughs> we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk about it in more detail. But <clears throat> If you're not, cav if we're a certain power going in, certain drive amplitude, if you're not cavitating at 50 feet, you're not going to cavitate below. Right. 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 It's higher, the higher the pressure. But if you go up and the pressure gets less, there's a chance of cavitation. And then I'll make this clear to you. Let me hold off on a clear explanation until next lecture. Um, hydrostatic pressure, this thing has to be able to go down to some depths. We'll talk again, we'll talk more about this, but here's the, here's the specification. Uh, 50 PSI. Resonant frequency, 5 kilohertz. That's specified, okay? Bandwidth, look at how this is stated. This is kind of, resonance shall be no more than 3 dB down from the resonance value, 5 kilohertz, at this. So how would we state this? There's a maximum Q that they're specifying here, and what is that Q? Anybody? You've been through this so many times in the lab. Five. Yes. Yeah. So Q, I think I'm going to try to write that in. This is from the textbook. I think I'm going to try to type that. I think I can overlay a, I can do this. I can modify this. Okay. So this is Q max, Q max of five. <coughs> uh, power handling, each element, 500 watts, continuous. Efficiency, this is typical, 50%, kind of typical, I think. We'll see that later on in the course for it's a tip, just typical value for efficiency. Um, <clears throat> impedance, the, trans, the transit will be parallel tuned and transformed to the impedance of, so this is, um, I, this is, I think this, they're talking about the amplifier here, hooking an amplifier up to this thing, and they want it to be approximately impedance matched. Now, what's this? Oh, by the way, it's also, we, we want to be able to operate as a receiver. We have a reciprocal transducer, it can operate as a receiver. So that's the specification here. Uh, to switch back and forth for, in the operation from a, a transmitter to a receiver. Uh, here's just voltage. Right, so, you know, I think that one of the reasons they could be staying this is, you know, you obviously you don't want arcing. So it, it better not arc, I guess, for 500 volts or less. And this is pretty obvious. And uh, the element shall weigh less than 10. It's easy to get carried away here and have come up with an element that's quite heavy, right? So they put a limitation on that. And if you take 10 and multiply it by... 10 pounds times 400, you get a couple tons. So this thing is like a car or something roughly, or 
whatever. Okay, so now what we're going to embark upon is we're going to actually go through a design process in a, in a simpler way than what's actually done, just to get a feel for the trade-offs here and how you have to, to come up with a um, design that's sufficient to meet specifications. Uh, there are always these counteracting things. You can, you know, you can improve something in, in one direction by turning some knob here, but it's going to cause a problem with some other feature. So there are always these trade-offs. So we're going to go through this. Again, it's, this is going to be not the full thing, but it's, it's, it'll be real enough for us. Okay. Um, now, if you look at the uh, diagram here, the tone pelts diagram here, typically this distance, this is a cylinder, piezoelectric cylinder, this distance is small compared to that, so what do we have? We have the expander. We have the expander bar. It's electroded here and here. I didn't mention it to you, but you can see it here. This is electroded inside, outside. So we imagine opening this up so we can use our theory. And we can come up with an equivalent circuit for this. We're just going to use the, we're going to modify the standard expander bar equivalent circuit that we derived. You'll remember it looks something like this, right? You've got the blocked capacitance, transformer to transform to mechanical quantities. And now there's a duplicity here in these impedances. And the reason is you can't neglect that clamp. You know, that's a strong steel bolt. So we have to include the, even though it's, it's not transducing, we have to include the mechanical properties of, of the bolt. And even the nut, okay, the nut represents a point mass as long as the frequency is not very high. So you're going to have an inductor here, right? So these primes here refer to the clamp bolt. All right? And we're actually being quite, Brian's being very general here, we're including possible standing waves in there. Now I just told you that I and mean, what do you think we're going to do with these expressions? These they're going to be, this is going to be, we're going to assume uniform compression and expansion. So th the standing wave character will go, we'll replace the tangent of this small quantity here with, with just that, okay? Now the C here refers to ceramic, the B refers to bolt. So the Z1, this is, this is the ceramic, this is the length of the ceramic, the script L. This is the cross-sectional area, which is obviously relevant of the ceramic. And here's the impedance, the wave impedance. If you look at Z prime here, now this is a similar um, thing for the clamp bolt. And I just, I just, I never noticed this before, but you see these expressions are, are essentially the same. The, the length here, is that right? The script L is the length of the ceramic. Looks to me like the clamp bolt can be longer than that, right? <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, you know, we can easily take that into account. We just call it this length right here. So even though this looks, this is pretty complicated here, this is the general standing wave case, and we're going to go to the low frequency limit here. And we know that when we do that, um, these become inertia-like And this becomes, uh, these are the stiffnesses here. So here they are, um, here, just as, we, as we've seen before. And there's a duplicity because of the um, stiffness of the, of the bolt. Oh, and the uh, tail, here's the mass of the tail. And then for actual operation, we have some, we have some radiation impedance, right? <coughs> Now, there's one thing that this, this is all, looks all nice and everything, but we made an assumption here. i have actually already talked about it. The, um, look at this, look at these, well, this is no problem, the nut, but the, here, I want you to look at this. We're treating these as purely inductance, you know, mass as, as, as mass. Is, is that going to be valid? Not if, if the, um, not if you've got waves in there. 
if, if, if we've already seen a problem if you have waves in the, in, the, in the head mass, right? Because it can cause, if you have flexure of the head, that's a problem. But there's another thing you want to recognize here. We're making an assumption here that this is acting as a, um, it's called a, a lumped element. Okay, we just have to worry about the inertia. We don't have to worry about the fact that we can have waves in there. So this will only be valid if the frequency is sufficiently low right here. And we will, that's something we will s explicitly check m Monday when we go through the analysis. When we can when we get quantitative on this. Um, now, finally, when we deal with hydrophones, the most important quantity is the open circuit sensitivity, right? What is the analogous quantity for a transmitter? Well, it's called, the, we talked a little bit about it last quarter, it's called the transmitting sensitivity. This is, I think they just carried over the word from the hydrophone. This is, I don't know if this is really appropriate, but that's what people call it, okay? It's a measure of, you know, I put voltage in and I get, pas you know, I put volts in and I get pascals out. Okay, for a hydrophone, um, it's the opposite. The pascals come in, you get the volts out. So for a hydrophone, what's relevant, we want to know that it's how many volts per pascal. Here it's going to be the reciprocal, it's going to be pascal per volt, that those are the units. And obviously, one of the most important things with a transmitter would be to calculate the transmitting, transmis, uh, the transmitting sensitivity. Just like a, a hydrophone, it's the, the, the sensitive, open, typically open circuit sensitivity. <clears throat> so I'll never forget, when I was first going through this material, um, I kept waiting. I said, wow, you know, this, this, is the bit, this is the bottom line. And I have to prepare you that we're only going to be able to do it in a few cases. It, it just gets to be quite complicated. All right? But the first one is coming up, and you already have it. It's on the quiz. I took the, the final problem that we did in the problem set, and we're going to extend it and come up with a transmitting sensitivity. And I, I got to tell you, one of the reasons I did this is because this, this is the bottom line for a projector. This is probably the most important quantity. I mean, there's, you know, there's other important quantities, obviously, but um, this is the main one, I would, I would think. So we should, in this course, we should strive to calculate these things. So we will, okay? But I just want to warn you that it's not, it's, whereas hydrophones, it's really easy, typically, to find, as you've seen again and again. It's difficult in transmitters. And we'll see why as we go along. But at least you have enough now where you can actually calculate the first, our first transmitting sensitivity in that, in that quiz. And I guide you how to do it, okay? Okay, are there any questions? Okay.